What are these banana bitches? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Behind the Sins, presented by Cinema Sins. <laughs> Welcome to Behind the Sins, your weekly look at all things Cinema Sins, Commercial Sins, and TV Sins. I'm your host, Aaron, but not that Aaron, of course. And this week, I'm joined by Cinema Sins staff member, Danae Hughes. Boop, boop. Danae, you're back. We finally got boop, you boop. back. Boop. Yeah, man. I was traveling. I was going to ask you about that. We got to hear Ian's side of your UK adventures oh, um, I, last I week. What did he say? Oh, he, he just said that you made him make English pancakes for you every morning, and you really liked mm-hmm. crumpets, and you had a friend uh-huh. with you. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's why we went. Like a one random person said happy Thanksgiving to you. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, that was really funny because we were visiting a, a pottery kiln because my friend that I was traveling with, we've been trying to plan something like this for years and years. Mm-hmm. And she's an archaeologist and mm-hmm. she studied this particular type of pottery called Staffordshire pottery. And Staffordshire is just north of where we were staying. So we decided to take a day trip. And go on a pottery tour. Like I wasn't thinking it was going to be very fun. Because it doesn't sound very fun. (laughs) But I ended up learning a lot. And of course seeing my friend super happy. And just like. She has this mind that just blows me away. Mm -hmm. And so seeing her like really excited about something. Made it like even better for for me. The the person who hasn't appreciated plates. Or really just (laughs) pottery in general. You know. To the degree that she has. (laughs) <laughs> so we get to the third location, which was one of the filming locations of Peaky Blinders, by the way. So we're walking around. And she's like, hey, this is where Peaky Blinders was filmed. And then, of course, Eden and I are like, what? But they had just closed. Like the whole facility had just shut down. We got there maybe like five minutes after close. Ooh. But this really kind lady flipped the lights back on. And she said, do you guys want to get in the kiln? And, of course, my friend Jenna is just like, uh, yes. So we go in this kiln that's been firing pottery since forever ago. She's just the happiest woman. We're like, thank you so much for letting us, you know, come in at the very end of the day. We know you probably want to get going. So we're kind of like trying to scoot out of there. And this kind woman pops out. At, she's like, no problem. You know, thanks for coming. And then we're walking away and then we hear, oh, and happy Thanksgiving, I think. <laughs> we're like, thank you. That's great. Yeah, you're that. you're right. It is things. It was just the coolest. It was the coolest thing. So yes, that was the random Thanksgiving. What a cool experience that was. But we were there for three weeks, so I have tons of stories, and I could kidnap this podcast to exclusively talk about my trip to England. But I don't think you guys want to hear all that. When when we're done recording, I'll I'll get off, and you can keep recording, and we'll just throw it all at the end of the episode. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's just yeah. me blabbering to myself. <laughs> which is something that happens all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're here to talk about some of the content of the week. Let's dive into the Sin Side Scoop. What's he building in there? I've got a secret. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. This is a true story. We'll kick things off with Monday's video, House of the Dragon. Season 1, Episode 8, The Lord of the Tides. As mentioned on last episode and before we started recording, today, um, you're very much not a fan of this show. No, this one still hasn't captured me, even all the way at this point. Uh, in fact, it's gotten worse. <laughs> so I think when we talked, it was kind of at the beginning of the series. And now here we're mm-hmm. kind of towards the end of the series. And there's just some things that I really don't enjoy. It, it never really captured me. Not not, okay. not ever. I understand. You know, and not every show is going to be for everybody. And like Ian said, it's like it almost like they wrote this show specifically for you to hate. Like there's just childbirth everywhere and oh my vomit God. and blood and oh, not enough dragons. God, the team, man, not only my team, but also like our editing team. I'm getting notes from people who are watching the next episode or two. They're like, do not watch this part. Do not watch this part. So <laughs> thankfully, we all, you know, try to look out for each other. <laughs> yeah. Well, Aaron and Jonathan wrote on this script. So what are some things about the video that you might have liked that you don't like the show? So what are some things about the video? I think they did a good job of hating the stuff that this show doesn't do very well. 
the six year time skip that sort of steals so much from the show. There's several sins that hit that throughout this, uh, this particular episode. And it really suffered here because the previous episode ends so epically. And then you come back in and it just asks you to assume a lot about the quiet spaces between the episode previous. And then six years is quite a long time. And I, I know that it's because they're trying to get to this specific place in the story. But I just, I don't know, maybe there was a different way to do it. Why not just start at that really interesting spot that you want to get to the the whole battle that this is leading up to the, the war between these houses and the dragon battles that we want to see, you know? So I thought that this video did a good job of not only hitting on the time skip, but not nearly enough dragon. Um, and also I think I, I, there's so many specific sins. I'm just doing like general ones for this one, but like there's also this recurring thing of like, naming your children the same thing and how much of a problem that is. And it really becomes evident in this one in a couple of ways. I think there was like an Eric or something person. Uh, or an yeah, Aaron. I think it's Aaron. Aaron, it's yeah. Both of them spelled not the way that I yeah. <laughs> it Sounds it's exactly like, the same. It's like A-E-A-R-Y-N or something like that. And then, and then there's the Agans and there's just, mm-hmm. there's all these very similar style names and we get to kind of hit on that being a problem with a big, nice punch at the end of this episode being, see, this is why you don't name them the same name. Because of course mm-hmm. the confusing comment from the King on his deathbed ends up launching uh, the next sort of pivotal plot point for this ep- uh, series. Yeah. Uh, that was one of the things I had wrote down. This is why you don't name all your kids, George Foreman. Uh, I also wrote down um, the return of the Royal skip. It's just yeah. good to see that come back. I like it. It's fun. Nice fanfare. And uh, I'm always going to write down if there's a small soldiers out of take. I love small soldiers. There's if somebody says who goes there. And um, Archer's command word was uh, or his go word, I guess. I don't know. was halt who goes there. And so there's the outtake that says I'm Archer, emissary of the Gorgonites. And I'm just I'm always going to note a small soldier. Reference. Sure. Of so, course. So thanks for that. Whoever wrote it down. The other one I had was getting one up by a guy who married his sister, because mm-hmm. if that doesn't describe this show, I don't know what does. Yeah. Awkwardly, yes. That describes everything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have a couple of questions about yeah. this. Um, the one that I want to start off with first is I feel like um, the, the the team is vocal about their frustrations on the YouTube algorithm and copyright laws and things like that. And normally the Sins team avoids putting any music in, but you manage to get a little snippet of a Downton Abbey um, intro. Uh, in there. Yes, yes. And so, like, how, like, <laughs> um, how, I, I wrote down algorithms. How do they work? Um. Well, yeah, that's exactly <laughs> it. Um, you know, if the team is vocal about algorithm, I think it's, we would love the freedom to put together the videos using the original music and even being able, especially when we send something that is a musical and we're yeah. referencing something that's being said. It would be so nice if we could actually play that and we had Mm -hmm. to change our writing style once we realized that uh there was a big push not only on youtube but on a lot of platforms Mm -hmm. to limit uh the use of music Mm -hmm. and so yeah if we're really vocal about that it's probably just that creativity part of us wanting it to be easier so we're pretty strict in some ways and then in some areas including on tv since we let ourselves experiment a little bit more from time to time and like just throw some stuff out there and see what happens. But there's always a chance that it's going to come back and bite us. And if Mm -hmm. that happens, then we have to go all the way back to the drawing board really late in the game. And, you know, for me, I don't risk it. I don't risk it at all because let's say that this is a video we couldn't release because of using Downton Abbey. Well, then we're not seeing episode eight, even though maybe nine and 10 are ready to go. So now we have to delay all of that mm-hmm. um, and, and redo an entire video. Sure. So it's a little risky, but every once in a while, we're going to still try to be a little experimental. And I guess this is just us trying to flex our creative wings a little bit. There you go. You flex away. I had another question. So last week, uh, the the narrator points out in one of the videos that he's always wanted to sing a particular song um, for for our context. And so I asked Ian to ask Jeremy, what's a particular song that he's always wanted to sing? What's on his wish list of wanted to sing? And so 
I wanted to ask Aaron this year, this week, because um, the lightning crashes, he gets to sing, and he gets <laughs> yeah. to sing the Phantom of the Opera. Uh huh. So last week we learned that Jeremy really wants to sing Sabotage. Um, what does Aaron really want to sing as part of the Cinema Sins video? I asked him this because I thought this was an interesting question, but just, you know, a little behind the scene thing. I actually wanted to end that Phantom thing even earlier, but Aaron loves to sing. And so unsurprisingly, <laughs> his answer is I'll sing whatever is put in front of me. He says... I love when I get to go big, but I also love when it's a song I don't even know and I have to learn it. Mm -hmm. uh, just as a side note, that's actually happened before where what was written, he didn't know. So he had to go listen to it several times to learn it, to emulate it, which is kind of fun for him. Yeah, I just didn't know if Aaron had a wish list because apparently Jeremy does. So I was like, what What songs does Aaron want to sing? That sounds fun. He will sing anything. He wants to sing anything. He wants to sing every song that's ever he been recorded. He loves to sing. Yeah. He loves to sing. So it's not its not like he has a goal. His goal is just to sing as much as possible, I guess. Mm. That's all I had. Do you have anything else? Nope. All right. You ready to not talk about House of the Dragon ever again? <laughs> I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Move on to Tuesday's video then. This is the Minority Report. Uh, Chris and Jeremy writing on this one. Denny, have you seen this movie? Yeah. I have. Oh, nice. I love this movie. I thought it was really interesting when I saw it the first time. It was uh, captivating and sci-fi, fantasy. Mm -hmm. uh, so it kind of ticked a lot of boxes for me. Um, although watching the Sins video is delightful because it has so many things that you know I really didn't consider because I was just in it for fun. But yeah, I loved this movie. The idea of having these like really high powered people that can predict certain things and a murder wrapped inside of it using their own powers against them and just like like what a cool idea all around um and i also remember when it came out like the visuals of it at the time were really interesting to look at with tom hanks like his hands up in the air doing all of the the work that he was doing. It was just something that hadn't been done before quite like it. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I really enjoyed watching this one. I mean, it's Tom Cruise. You said Tom Hanks, but I, like, I, I like that. I like that visual too. <laughs> hey, Tom Hanks. It's okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Both are fun images. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. One of them is real and one of them's made up. So <laughs> I can't imagine Tom Hanks in this role. <laughs> no, 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 no. Not even a little bit. And that's nope. why it's fun. But yeah, yeah, no, this, this movie just has a lot of like really interesting ideas and, like plays off of a lot of like really fun concepts pretty well. Yeah, I mean to a, to a point as the scenes video keeps on pointing out. But yeah, I the of course have to write down that um, the line says "got to keep running" and it's Tom Cruise's kid. And so the narrator mm -hmm. just said, "Yep, that's Tom Cruise's kid." All right, this I love. And there's like three or four like Tom Cruise running jokes. I yeah, I love them. They're hilarious. Yeah, yeah. There's some standard ones that when I first started writing, I wouldn't have known them, and I wouldn't have known that there are certain repeating storytelling tropes that happen but it's really interesting like the one with brad pitt always eating food mm -hmm. uh tom is always running <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh those are the two like most for. notable yeah yeah um what are some of the things you had from the video i wrote down quite a few because i really enjoyed this one some of the highlight ones was like there was this one moment when there's a sign that says keep out no trespassing and it's a really simple sin where it's like this sign says keep out no trespassing to people only after they enter and if they decide to look backwards. Yeah. And I love finding those kinds of sins in what we tackle uh, just where it's like the sign is designed for us to see, but it makes no sense for the person on screen. I mean, unless it's double sided, but like, it, you know, the sign has to be held up by a stick. And so presumably at least the main portion is obstructed by the stick. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's a very simple sin that, yeah, yeah. it's very stupid in context. Um, on like the more complicated sins, there was a back to back where uh, it was about the the guy who um, I can't remember his name. But the sin is so wait, you lived in Ireland until you're 15 and yet you somehow developed an American accent just a few years later. And then the narrator says, also, can we rewind this? And then it replays a little bit of the lead in a commentary and is reacting to the dad being killed. Like this character is, mm -hmm. I think it's Colin Farrell's Farrell. dad mm -hmm. being killed, or whatever. Um, and then sin says, so if your dad was killed with your when you're 15, how was he proud of your time at the seminary you don't join seminary before the age of 15 right that kind of more complex thinking is fun it states the first part and then it stops and rewinds and then it replays and then it keeps going again instead of doing like an also sin this one is constructed very specifically because it's a 
following two trains of thought in one moment. And I thought that they did a really good job of kind of presenting uh, that. I remember when I saw this one, I actually looked up seminary information because I was like, that's probably true. Like kids can't go that early. And I couldn't find anything that proved otherwise. So I'm sure it's like any other standard like higher education where there's always special access. But like, well, we've not gotten any indication that Colin Farrell is a savant in this movie. So like, right. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure Tom Cruise insisted that they build authentic 2054 roadways so that he could make his actual climb. Mm-hmm. Same thing, Tom Cruise doing his own stunts. Great running. Yeah, game. and that one was followed by not dying while doing this, which I thought was really funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think this is my favorite video of the week, by the way. Oh, uh, cool. And my favorite sin from this video was uh, the line is, you wouldn't break the hand of a violinist before the concert. And the narrator says, I would if the violinist injected <laughs> me with unknown chemicals with a surprise syringe. Like... <laughs> It's it's such a bad analogy, like, you know, like it doesn't negate the fact that you just pump whatever he he doesn't know in you and you say it's anesthetic and like turned out to be anesthetic, but like he doesn't know that there's no way to confirm that, especially when he has a motive to kill to harm Tom Cruise. Yeah, this movie has several kind of uncomfortable situations, like the eyeball stuff and like. I don't know. There's a couple ones where it's just like, I don't want to see it. No, like it's too close Mm -hmm. up, too close up. Like, and and one of the sins is uh, he was warned repeatedly that if he took off his bandages early, he'd go blind. But here he is proving that all that's shit to be a filler dialogue that wasn't true and doesn't matter. And I like that sin because the movies do this interesting thing and where it builds this tension. And if you're not paying attention to whether or not that tension actually is justified you don't realize how much of the tension building is just to make you feel something in the moment it doesn't actually have a payoff right and that was one of them when the sins video points out that like in the scene where he's recovering it's like there's already enough tension here he's a very wanted person in that you don't need to add the spider drones to add tension yeah Um, this is already an incredibly tense scene or no it's the throwaway line about how he locked him up in prison it's like i don't need the extra tension of why this one surgeon might also want to harm him like yeah exactly um speaking of the electronic spiders getting cock blocked by electronic spiders is no longer a freak experience specific to me i love <laughs> love that add it to the narrator's checky, uh-huh. uh, oh i know backstory oh my god his backstory must be just so rich with random shit at this point it's pretty good stuff yeah um i didn't have very many more i, I really liked the herbal tea so the lead-in was like herbal tea with honey and then the other person says i hate herbal tea almost as much as i hate honey and the sin is, imagine going around complaining about and hating on everything. What a sad life that would be. I, <laughs> I love when we kind of make fun of ourselves a little mm-hmm. bit. And my last one that I wrote down is a silly one, but it's one of my favorites, which is precog pool functions as a convenient escape toilet. Just mm-hmm. like calling it an escape toilet. I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah. And I don't know any other way to describe it. Like, I'm pretty sure even like those water slides, like they're, yeah. they're called like toilet bowl. You know, I had organ playing an organ. That was hilarious. And, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> the and then at the end, in like one of the last flashbacks, like there's massive lens flares going on and the narrator's just like almost sneezing. It was hilarious. <laughs> that was so funny. The one question I had about this video is the narrator makes a comment uh, about uh, John tries to stuff a towel under the door, but that didn't yeah. prevent the Red Roof Inn staff from smelling the weed. <laughs> Do we have a story time? You know, it's not a long story, but there is one. Jeremy said it was actually a Knight's Inn at the time. But for the the script, he thought the Red Roof Inn would roll off the tongue a little bit better. And that was when he learned that getting a smoking room doesn't help you hide the smell of weed. So there is a true story, but that's all the information I have on that one. <laughs> I love it. Um, also, great. Chris kind of wrote in some of his thoughts on creating yeah. this one. He said, my minority report is a movie where the orgy of evidence sins derived from, but we have never sinned the movie itself. In the uh, run up to the 10th anniversary, I thought we should finally sin it, especially with Steven Spielberg coming out with the Fablemans and riding momentum from that. I love this movie. Uh, much of what this movie portrays as the future has actually come true. I wasn't sure how cynical it was, but like always, if you ever peer under the CinemaSins microscope, you're going to find some. One of the infuriating things about the movie is the opening scene where they should definitely have enough information to stop this murder before it happens, especially in a society where everywhere you go, your eyeballs get scanned. We're told the system is quote unquote perfect and no murders have happened since they started the program. But the very first scene shows how close it can get 
And it's impossible that they could get to every one of those on time, especially if more than one murder is taking place in a completely different part of the city. Mm -hmm. The most cynical part of this movie might be the fact that once John Anderton, Tom Cruise, is a wanted man, the pre-crime division doesn't strip him of all of his credentials, allowing him to sneak back into the building later and steal Agatha. I also thought it was uh, weird that John's murder is considered premeditated when he hasn't even heard the victim of the victim before. And Lamar's plan to get John arrested, which requires a lot of forethought with too many variables and paradoxes to actually work. My favorite sin I wrote was the one about how John Anderton doesn't want to kill Leo Crow. But when Crow turns, John's gun on himself and fires. The shot that they use for John's reaction is the same one that they use for the precog vision. So it looks like John really wanted to kill that guy, even though it's clear mm-hmm. throughout the scene that he did not. And I yeah, thought that it, was a good point, too. Like, it, it looked like he was, like, really aiming at that guy. So, And it's so disconnected because, like, when he actually gets shot, like, they're so close together. And he's got, like, a surprise look on his face. Like, no, yeah. you didn't just do that. And then, like, they're separated a little bit. and And he's, like... You know, got his arm fully extended. He's mm-hmm. got a, like a mean look on his face. Like, I'm going to. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. so jarring. Yep. Um, speaking of jarring, how about a transition to TV sins? Let's um, do it. <laughs> Rick and Morty, uh, season four, episode three. One crew over the cuckoo's Morty. Good These job, are always good job. so hard to say. I know. I know. Uh, Jonathan and Ian writing this script. Um, I only have one thing that we need to talk about, and it's okay. everything having to do with the future narrator. <laughs> um, this is a really fun concept. Yes. And Ian wrote in on that. So the concept was Ian's. And so I'll kind of read his thoughts if you want me to jump right into that one. Sure. Uh, I, I do want to say that one of my favorite sins is I have two. I have two sins that I really, really loved. One was. Uh, the narrator saying, I like Mr. Poopy Butthole. And then the future narrator saying, no, you don't. <laughs> Which I thought yep. was just like he has future knowledge that doesn't actually ever appear on screen. Which is really funny to me. That, that one cracked me up. And then when both narrators send Elon Musk at the same time, that was uh, truly delightful. But I didn't actually watch this episode of Rick and Morty. Oh. So I only watched the Sins video. Uh, so it's kind of one of those things where I'm watching it going, I just have to trust that you guys know what the fuck you're talking about. Because it was... Mm-hmm. You no, know, quite epic. But here is what Ian has to say. He said, I knew we had to do something different with this one because on my initial watch through, I had to keep crossing out my notes and initial sins because it turned out that the episode was doing this shit on purpose to do some big reveals later in the episode. So instead of throwing out my notes, I came up with the idea that the narrator wouldn't necessarily know that he was going to be proved wrong. So would decide to go back in time and correct himself. Of course, this creates a paradox where he knows he has to go back in time, but never understands why his voice changes. The bootstrap paradox is one of my favorite paradoxes because it makes the most sense. What will happen will happen again because it already happened. It's really the only way you can get time travel to work narratively. And the bottom line is I got to fulfill a little fantasy and write my own time travel story inside of a sins video and i have to say (laughs) so when ian did this we were all co-working together so he was in the united states at this time and he was sitting there and he was working on his script and i'm working on my script aaron's working on his script and he just kind of goes oh no i have to write a time travel script (laughs) (laughs) and i just like turned like wait why do you have to and he really struggled through like this is going to take effort this is going to take time i've got to write this out make it make sense make sure that the editing team knows the visual like make sure that all this goes together and you know his writing partner jonathan had to kind of be in on it too and so jonathan sins needed to be able to be in the script too and also make sense so it was quite an undertaking and it's like one of those things where you know that maybe you could just not do the complicated thing, but he couldn't mm-hmm. let it go. He's like, this is the perfect opportunity to do this time travel situation. And he did. And I think it's brilliant. I think Denise says it best. Denise on YouTube leaves a comment. And he, uh, we like Denise, friend of the show. Uh, Denise says, uh, this is some Rick and Morty level writing from the TV Sins writers. Well done, guys. My head is officially fucked. Uh, <laughs> it was so fun to watch, too, because even if you haven't seen the video, you can kind of like get what's going on. And I love how the editors added like the little portal 
mm-hmm. and then the the subtitles like fly out of it and land mm-hmm. and then he makes it make sense that the voice is different and then writes in the voice difference at the end to make sense for the beginning all around pretty great i guess speaking on that note um i had a question for aaron mm-hmm. uh what were the narrator notes or inspiration for the future narrator's voice i noted that it kind of sounds like patrick warburton yeah so um i think i've got aaron's perspective first and then i can flip over to ian so aaron said as far as the narrator notes for my future narrator voice we went back and forth on it we thought of doing accents but then just decided to adjust the tone to be lower he says i wasn't thinking of warburton when i did it but you are not wrong (laughs) (laughs) And then Ian said originally he floated the idea of a Southern or a British accent, but they didn't want the ver- uh, the varying quality of Aaron's impressions to distract from the time travel narration idea that they're putting together. So when Aaron suggested suggested the deeper tone, they went with that. Another alternative, Ian says, was pretending that Sinsworth had gained mm. sentience and traveled back in time. And we just used a robot filter for the future narr- uh, narrator sins. I like this better than that, but that's a yeah. clever suggestion. Which one he was was defending Ocean's Twelve because I like that movie. It was Jonathan. Uh, Ian thinks that Twelve sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that way for a long time. Ian, one day you will recognize that, that movie is actually pretty good. And then I guess one more film uh, <laughs> film critique question. Uh, the line says we don't all have to like the same stuff. We don't have to agree, uh, except for Army of the Dead. Fuck that movie. I just wanted to know. You could have picked any movie. Why'd you pick that one? Um, Ian answers this one and says, because it fucking sucks, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> I guess he big time hates it. He says, fuck it hard. I hope it gets stuck in the gravity well of a black hole and time dilation causes it to be painfully spaghettified for a million years before finally being snuffed from existence across all space and time. So he really doesn't like that one. I don't love it, but like, <laughs> that's a little harsh. <laughs> Aw, don't worry. It, it can't feel anything. <laughs> <laughs> Man, my biggest fear of doing this podcast is that Ian's going to start viewing me like Jerry and he's just going to hate me. <laughs> <laughs> nah. Uh, do you have any other, that's all I had. Do you have anything else you want to touch on? Nope, that's it. Very nice. Well, let's move on to Thursday's video, Minions, The Rise of Gru. Danae, you uh, were a writer on this one with Daniel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's. I haven't seen this movie, uh, but I really hate the first Minions movie. Yeah. And Despicable Me 3 is okay but the first two were pretty good and i thought the trailer for this one looked really funny and then everybody was like you thought that was funny you're a child and you know welcome to me and then uh all the reviews were like this is drivel so Mm. i never saw it did you like it i don't really have much of an appreciation for the minions movies the minions themselves i think i understand why they're so interesting for the young audience because their little voices sound adorable Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're doing silly things and they're indestructible. But I hadn't written on a Minions movie before. So this was dropping me into the universe at this point in their production. So I kind of had to do a little bit of research going into this one to kind of give mm. myself an understanding of what's going on here. So I, I had to learn about what Minions are and that's been answered in other movies. So I kind of got my bearings straight and then jumped into this one. Because, you know, if I hadn't really done research, I might be sending things that have been answered in other material. And that kind of becomes an important part of what we do is writing, you know, when we're writing is make sure that we have the context. <laughs> so we're not inaccurate. Um, and I was starting off just going in blind. And so I was like, what are these banana bitches? Like, I was so angry about them. <laughs> But it turns out that they're, I guess, somewhat indestructible. But so so I kind of fixated a little bit on the goggles on this one because I don't understand why they anyway, there's I have questions, but they're questions that everyone probably has about the minions. So finding a way to make it kind of fun to write. But I liked a lot of the sins that Daniel wrote on this one because mm. he so, so one of the things that is said in this one is um, find your tribe and never let them go. Probably one of the largest sins of the film is something that Daniel pointed out. The sin was if Gru really had internalized this lesson at this stage in his life, which is when he was a kid, Mm -hmm. then why would the whole first movie about him learning to embrace? Like, why did we have the whole like embracing orphan children to learn? Like, So it kind of takes away from the existing content. Well, and not only that, but he treats the minions poorly in the Despicable Me movie. So like, yeah. if, if he's learning this lesson as a kid and he grows up with the minions, like, 
why does he hate yeah them? like there's a lot of force to me it felt very forced and kind yeah. of simplified even to the point of dr nefario which was one of my biggest concerns like in this mm-hmm. movie dr nefario or nefario or however you say his name gives him his inventions even though mm-hmm. he's a child that should have a parent nearby and doesn't it's like a weird reality and i get that Gru has a weird relationship with his mom and his mom is sort of distant or whatever but it was just very confusing to me how forced that even that relationship was it didn't seem like it was like oh this is how they met it's like wait you have a brilliant inventor that works for this other crime organization that just decides to give his inventions to this random child and then sort of adopt him and then Mm -hmm. escape with him in a spacecraft later at the very end of the movie that doesn't seem that doesn't set up the next movie that just opens up more questions um and it doesn't pose Gru as the evil genius that we're supposed to believe he is like he didn't actually accomplish anything in this movie (laughs) no no he doesn't like Gru himself doesn't earn a lot in this movie he's just a character that becomes something later and this movie is pretending like this is the beginning of his very important start and so you have things like that that points out the plot line looseness of this world of this minion world of this franchise but then you have stuff that's really bad, like forgetting to animate a pool, which mm-hmm. was my most annoying sin the entire thing. And how do you forget to animate a pool? <laughs> oh, I was so annoyed by that. So it's it was a fun one to sin because it was obvious things that we could go at. Uh, so, yeah, we had a good time on this one. It was a lot of fun to watch. Uh, good. Lots of giggles, lots of chuckles. Good, good, good. I love the, it's not, it's not that I want to see a butthole, but it's where the butthole should be. <laughs> and that makes this a cat's level of butthole erasery. Oh God, Daniel cracks me up. Oh it's, my God. It's just so funny because it's like, look, I'm not saying that I want to see the butthole, but if you're going to show me the butt, you got to show the hole. Like- <laughs> I feel like Daniel was on another level on this one because he wrote one that was so simple. Like the, the lead in was something about being a pinball wizard and his sin was bragging about your supple wrists. And I just like <laughs> uh, that was unexpected out of nowhere. So funny to me. He also wrote the one about the coast. The lead in uh-huh. is something like you're lucky. Uh, it's uh, like the minion gets picked up by the motorcyclist person that's wearing the amulet. And he's like, it's your lucky day, kid. I'm I'm headed up the coast. And then Daniel's like, these two are later seen driving down the coast. And it's just, you know, sometimes just pointing stuff out is what yeah. works. But it's just so funny whenever it's so sarcastic. And I don't know, he was he was on another level on this one. I really enjoyed riding with Daniel. Yeah. Uh, we never get to see Wild do this trick from the front. And I'm both great, th- thankful and annoyed at the same time. Yeah, so... This character, Wild Knuckles, uh-huh. does this sort of like five martial arts thing. Yeah. sort of thing and literally grows another couple arms. And that never happens again the rest of the movie. And if you can mm-hmm. do that and your life is in danger several times during the rest of this movie, why are you not using your additional appendages? I don't understand. I don't understand either, but... As the video points out, I'm kind of grateful I don't have to see it again. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I suppose that is a better name than the Goopy Grope. Yes. Yep. Remarkable. That's um, good and stuff. I, I love the com- commercial sins insert at the beginning of, I thought that was hilarious. Yeah, so. that was fun. Sometimes I like to play around with our format a little bit. Yeah. You mentioned a lot of the ones I really, really enjoyed. I got to sin something that bothers me a lot in this one mm-hmm. that I was thankful for. So when you're driving in a vehicle and someone says, yeah, yeah, it's to the left. Yeah, that's right. Don't do that. Don't say that's right. (laughs) Say that's correct (laughs) because you're giving directional instructions. (laughs) So it's, it's super annoying. Like if I say, am I supposed to be going left here? And they say, yeah, right. Okay. Am I going? So then I'll go right. You know? So anyway, Mm -hmm. um, I got to kind of send, I got to send that. The English vocabulary is too large to (laughs) have that mistake. Mm -hmm. I also really loved that both uh, Daniel and I kind of went at a couple of things. We got to do some combines on this one where we combined our mutual hatred of the finger guns. There is a like a CIA agent that uses literally just pops out of a vehicle to stop a bad guy using literal finger guns. We both caught that and send that. 
And we also really fixated on the fact that the necklace was called a stone. This amulet was called a stone the whole time. And it really bothered us. Um, we actually cut several references of it from the, the script, but that one was another one that just, we couldn't, we couldn't put down. So sure. Yeah. But yeah, those are kind of the several other ones that we enjoyed writing on. I didn't write down any particular questions, but it does look like you have a couple of behind the scenes <laughs> things that you uh-huh. would like to share. Yeah. So there was a sin that Daniel wrote. It's like when the pilot, the air, airline pilots appear Mm -hmm. and the pilot is telling the story to his buddies and so the lead-in says so there i was we lost thrust in both engines and i had to turn back at laguardia and then all of the people that are traveling with him laugh the sin is this animated personification of an embry riddle student's wet dream and i didn't get it um which happens a lot when you're writing and your partner has a different perspective so you just you ask the question so it's like hey I don't understand this reference, so I'm probably going to need help understanding it. And Daniel writes back, Embry-Riddle uh, Aeronautical University is the first college I went to. So there's some interesting facts about Daniel you might not know. Um, he goes on to say they are well known in the aviation world and have a program for commercial pilots. While I was there, it was a bit of an ongoing joke that all the pilots thought they were way cooler than they actually were. And when I saw this moment of the pilot bragging in the movie, it just reminded me of those guys. I wrote back to him and said, it sounded like a good BTS story. And his response is also pure gold. He says, for me, it's a story of academic failure, but I'm fine with sharing it. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my God. Uh, are you sure? Okay. Daniel's so that was kind of fun. Hilarious. I didn't know that about Daniel, but what a what an ambitious thing to do. Neither um, did I. Yeah. So he kind of had a unique perspective on that particular scene. I also just love that. Um, so this this is what I love about you, Danae, is that according to the timestamp here, you guys were working on this two months ago. October yes. 8th is the timestamp. So like, yeah, most people would have forgotten about that. But here you come prepared. Well, remember last time I was on, you're like, wow, Danae, you're not writing on a lot. And I'm like, dude, you have no idea. Yeah, we <laughs> we don't release everything that we do as soon as we're done with it. We have a rhyme and a reason for our scheduling. So yeah, this one's been in the can for a while, ready to go. <laughs> yeah. But it's just like, it's two months ago and here you are like, hey, I remember Daniel said that would be a good BTS story. Yeah. When, actually, I think BTS was at that point, like was just kicking off the ground again in season three. So yeah, I remember those things. I, I think that those conversations are fun and interesting. And before I got on with you today, I was like, hey, just we talked about this in October. Is it okay that I bring this up? And, you know, Daniel yeah. said it was okay to talk about. Um, I also asked my friends if I could revisit the conversation about the suburban sized toilet sin. <laughs> I won't take up a lot of time explaining it, but essentially I wrote the sin about the size of Gru's bathroom compared mm-hmm. to his house. Like it is a huge yeah. bathroom and it really bothered me that essentially it was the size of his bedroom. Mm-hmm. And so I write the sin that's like, this is bigger than my childhood bathroom. And that bathroom was the size of a suburban. What this essentially did was start up a conversation, not only between Aaron, who was the one who was kind of coming in and and looking at the script with us, but the conversation carried over because Ian was in town, it carried over to Ian as well, where they were like, you could change the sin to say something really, really small to prove your point. So I think it would change it to Yaris maybe in the final video, but it was started off as suburban because if you think about going to the bathroom in something the size of a suburban, it's really small, but because a suburban is a big car, they're like, yeah, but it'd be better if it was actually something smaller. So we just like had this really passionate conversation (laughs) about how to phrase this particular (laughs) sin. And when I say we, I mean me. (laughs) I was like, suburban is funny that's super funny but then i think i ended up just uh-huh. being like you know what let's just do yaris and i get it you know we'll just dumb it down i guess <laughs> Which I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding guys i'm kidding but then i went back in today and kind of razzed him again i was like hey guys remember the conversation about the suburban bathroom they're like oh my god danae <laughs> Please, stop <laughs> you can let it go so there's a couple stories about that particular one that you might find interesting. 
I did find them interesting, so mission accomplished. Uh, that'll take us to Friday's video commercial since the direct TV is get your TV together. This one was remarkably great. Um, who did this one, by the way? This was Chris. I don't really get like the commercial sound. I think it's just like pretty flux, like in flux. So uh, I was like, okay. But it's, yeah, you can tell it's just like there's the point where, where it's like the housewives are on the field all of a sudden. And then it, and then it's just like, well, surely they're not going to keep playing. Oh, they're playing. All right. And then it's, you know, talking about the like, if this is combining this, what about other people that are switching back and forth? Like, why are they not? I love Angry Chris. And I say this angry every Chris week so because fun. every week it gets angry and I love I it. So It's so great. Well, and there's something and I, I've noticed about this as well with narration. Like if, if Jeremy writes on a script and he and then, of course, he narrates it, there are some things that he delivers I feel differently because he has a very passionate link to what he has written. Mm -hmm. Um, Similar for Chris, like hearing the rage in his delivery of this commercial (laughs) was so fun. I do have what he wrote about this experience. If you want me to read it. He said the direct TV ad is one that plays incessantly during football games. And I hate it. I think it's because I'm not a fan of quote unquote, the real housewives of whatever city they're from as I have never watched it. And I find this crossover with them playing football pretty obnoxious. The feature DirecTV is advertising is the switch between live TV and on demand. And I think that feature is virtually worthless. I wanted to send this a few weeks ago, but I couldn't quite find the angle. Then a lot of ideas came to my head, mostly involving being very dumb about the impossible crossover and how it's against the rules of football. My favorite thing, though, was to send the couple at the beginning of this ad They are an innocent couple doing nothing wrong. And I just created a huge, silly backstory for them. The acoustic guitar sitting in a chair nearby became the long sin about a nebulous relationship. By sin two, I'm admitting I don't know if they're married or what, (laughs) but I think it's weird to sit someone down on a couch and start doing the advertised speak like the woman does. Mm -hmm. As for the table flipping, oh, I guess you had a question about table flipping. So maybe you should ask your question and then I'll, I'll answer that one. Oh, this is not really intended to be a question. It's just the only sin that I like, actually wrote down. It's just who flips who flips the table, and it says, I guess this is hilarious to people who have actually seen the show. Yes. I, I figured it was like an actual like reference to something. It but has again, to be. I don't watch The Real Housewives of whatever, whatever. Yeah, I don't know. And like, I can't imagine many people that are watching football are. So like, right. it's not enough in pop culture if it did happen. You know, there's plenty of stories you could be like, oh, yeah, this one time, you know, Honey Boo Boo did whatever, you know. Right. And pe- and people would know. Well, he says, um, as for that sin, the table flipping, which leads to gargoyle figurines in a comic book called Mama Stole My Vast Deference. That's a bit of a randomness that per- perhaps only I will enjoy. But I've never heard vast deference thrown casually into an observation before. So I decided to re uh, reward the viewing public with a disturbing look into my psyche. And perhaps people might. Uh, Google the term and learn a bit about themselves. Do you know what the vast deference is? Not a little bit. Nope. (laughs) Not even a little. I'm going to find out tonight though. Oh my God. So I, because of how I went through school, I I know what the vast deference is. Have fun. Have fun. (laughs) Uh, I'm scared now. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, that's, I didn't intend it to be a BTS thing, but now it is. And that's great. There Um, you go. One more video for the week, uh, the 10th anniversary recent uh, Avatar. You and Ian writing on this script. Mm -hmm. Um, What an intense thing to be told you're going to do. (laughs) Yeah, here's a two and a half hour movie that's, you know, lauded for its visual effects um, and criticized for its storytelling. But also has already been done. I was so sweaty going into this. <laughs> it's like sometimes you're assigned something and you're like, I don't think I have it in me. And then you're like, you know what? You know what? No, what? I'm going to do it. I'm just going to do it. And I ended up having a great time. <laughs> so, I This movie is, to me, I rewatched it recently. Mm-hmm. It is deservedly praised for its visuals, but that's pretty much all. I think the characters are paper thin and... The story is remarkably simple and there's a lot of like hints at some really interesting things. And the movie just isn't interested in exploring any of those. But uh, having ta- like seen messages from Aaron recently who just got to see it, um, mm. it sounds like all that's going to change for the future installments. So I guess I'm a little. Yeah, I, I think it's a good thing to revisit. Like there were some things that James Cameron did. Like I watched this in the theater um, in 3D. It was so beautiful. And. 
I didn't realize as I was watching it how much, how, like you said, paper thin. And I think Ian wrote the sin about the characters being these like wafer thin characters and his points. Like if this movie gave Pandora a Silmarillion, it left humanity with a paint by numbers book that doesn't use numbers above two. And I thought that was a really nice way of slamming. Mm-hmm. And I just, you know, like I didn't pick that up on my first watch because I was completely distracted by this unique world. Uh, mm-hmm. And it was really, really groundbreaking. I remember people like there was news stories coming out of people that went into depression after Avatar stopped playing in the theaters because they couldn't go back into that world. I don't, do you remember that? I don't know. Yeah, there was like this whole thing where there was this just depression because this Pandora world is not real. And people just wish that it was. They wish that hold this on, was something on. we went to. You mean to tell me that fictionalized worlds created in movies aren't real? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <sighs> Danae, why did you have to do that to me? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Do you need to take a minute? Uh, I need to take a month or two. Okay. Is this, is this, a, is this a good time to look for we'll someone just, else we'll to do the show? We'll reconvene at the end of January. <laughs> yep. Um. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, this was a big undertaking for a lot of reasons, whether the story is something that people enjoy or don't enjoy. Like that, There's parts of it that are just like the normal colonization story. Asshole mm-hmm. colonizer comes in, ruins native culture unapologetically. And this movie doesn't really address that. It kind of embraces that in an odd way. Like it kind of like it puts this beautiful world at the forefront and makes us love it. But it doesn't actually address some of the problems of the white savior. And I feel like our culture has advanced in conversation enough to have better conversations and have hopefully been able to have approached it differently where maybe there was some more depth to it. But the fact that Sully is considered the savior at all is mind boggling when you watch this again. And it's something I completely missed the first time, but was really easy to sin the second time. Yeah. So, but it's still a big undertaking because obviously these reasons are a big deal. We have already done them once and it's kind of like whomever is assigned to it, it's like, okay, it's your turn to go to bat. We're re-releasing content that the audience has already enjoyed once. So hopefully they enjoy it the second time, like do your thing. And so it just feels like the pressure is on a little bit more with these reasons, but I'm really glad that we're doing them. Yeah. Unob- yes, unobtainium because can't fucking get it right. Uh, useful for reason. I, oh, wow. Uh, whatever and <laughs> i can't even say it i don't know how jeremy does it um, we give him narration prompts <laughs> yeah I'm sure. yeah so we'll on this one the entertaining can't fucking get it night useful for reasons tonight and platesium uh, we will on a separate so on our script sheet we'll have mm-hmm. something that's just for him so on something like this we break it into its components so it's easier for him to read <laughs> So. That would be helpful. Yes. Uh, it's just great. I, I heard recently that um, they call it unobtainium. And that's actually like a I, I've heard I heard that it's actually a common Hollywood thing, like to talk about something like a MacGuffin like this. Um, like they will call it unobtainium, you know, like like something yeah. like vibranium. And uh-huh. so that's Cameron interesting. choosing to call it unobtainium is actually meta in a way. It yeah. doesn't make it like clever because this isn't a movie about Hollywood. Like, but it's still <laughs> it just makes it boring like it makes it uninspired anyway uh one of the things that jeremy did say in his notes on this one was he like because he was reviewing the script he said you guys are going to try to break my mouth on this one (laughs) and i i reply yeah we had a meeting about it and decided that it was time to break you (laughs) (laughs) poor guy (laughs) poor guy there's actually a couple on here I peeked at your notes and i've got another one that he commented on in fact if you do you want to do the flying flying still flying that one Oh, that's a, I that's a don't fun think one. I wrote that. I think you copied that in the my section of the notes. I don't think. I yeah. Wrote that oh, OK. Then. Yeah. So there's the one where it's like flying, flying, still flying, landing, landing, still landing, still landing. It's excitement. And then I want to say that this is the only FFSFLLSLSSLE sin that we have in this movie, but it isn't. It, Jeremy, he's like, OK, well, this should be fun to narrate. And I'm like, you are welcome. <laughs> it's like. We really just gave it to him on this one with a couple. <laughs> and, you know, he had to narrate all these really interesting like words like Awa and all this stuff. And if he gets it wrong, the whole thing, he has to do it all over again. And we had all of the pronunciation for him and we just didn't we weren't clear on a couple of them. So, yeah, he had to redo this one. Mm. It was a lot of work, but 
We definitely put Jeremy through the ringer on this one. I, I just want to publicly say I, I am sorry, but you did a great job. It was, was, yeah. it was delightful to watch. <laughs> sure. The floating mountains, how do they work? Amazing. How do they work? I'm going to write down every single time there's a how do they work in uh, in a video. I like the one where Jeremy got to sing the maybe it's make believe on this one. Mm -hmm. That was fun. Uh, and uh, also <laughs> the uh, Prometheus School of Running Away from Trees is oh my God. hilarious. <laughs> <sighs> you know, Ian just sometimes just kills me. <laughs> See, I, I regularly compare myself unhealthily. To other people mm -hmm. it's just it's really hard when you work with fucking hilarious people and you're just like oh my god that was brilliant how did you do that my god the only thing i want to know is um i love the outtakes there's a back to back to back of with the with the like bird that jake winds up riding and it's just the goat screaming was hilarious followed by a warrior's outtake from can you dig it <laughs> followed by the uh fishy why are you sleeping <laughs> You want to hear a fun story, Denny? Yeah. So I have told my wife that the next dog that we get, I would like to name Fishy just so I can annoy it. Because as it's just sleeping, I can just scream at it. Fishy, why are you sleeping? Oh, my God. Um, That's amazing. Do yeah, it. Yeah, she it's not going to let that happen. But <laughs> I, I think that overall on this script... There's a couple long, like there's some long ones where we really like dig into it. And I don't want to read all of them because they're kind of long, but we kind of do like the political tension thing. I think one of the things that like one, bes besides the white savior stuff that we just already talked about, but like there's this idea that there's this tension between the scientists and the military that are on Pandora. And there's several scenes where it just seems like no one's talking to each other. And, and then like they even really just skip over the fact that Sully's never been in an avatar suit before and they have time to debrief him on important things, but they don't so that there's a plot thing that happens later. Mm -hmm. And when you start to like really question how expensive it is to create one of these and how little they seem to be paying attention, like the, the whole thing of wanting to avoid war with the natives, but never once has this important tree structure come into play until the tree structure itself is nearly going to be destroyed. This movie does things where it introduces the tension right in that decision-making moment rather than what would actually be happening, which is a lot of conversations. And they do that for the sake of the momentum of the movie and feeling the tension. But what's crazy is that this movie has so much tension. And I kind of like, I realized that uh, when they're getting on the Banshee and they're just jumping off of this cliff, it's like, we have no time to take a breath in this movie. It's just thing after thing after. So it feels like this really intense ride the mm -hmm. whole time. And speaking of ride, we did get to send the ride and Disney uh, not being for tall people. That's a very personal story, too, where it's just like, I, you know, I know someone who can't ride this ride that's met, uh, based on nine foot tall creatures. So that was kind of mm -hmm. nice to, like, give it to the movie for my buddy. I felt good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Take it, ride. Yeah, take it. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Who Googled if you could watch a cremation through a window and what did you find out? Oh, my God. Who that was me. It actually came up in the review process, too, where Jeremy was like, I think it would be kind of interesting if we did research this. And I said, please don't make me, but I will. OK, fine, I will. And then I went and I did some research. The short of it is that, no, you don't get to just so it looked like Jake's brother's box that he was in was like a wooden box. Yeah. You would never get to like look through a window and watch this box be burned away and then watch your loved one's corpse be burned away. That's just not going to happen. But I didn't really want to keep Googling that specific information, to be honest with you. Like I was like, oh, OK, I got to stop because I kept finding things that were really awkward, like, for example, crematory uh, scandals where a crematorium was discovered to not have been cremating anyone and instead burying them back in the lot and then just giving them random ashes. That's very recent stuff going on. And I'm like, you know what? I just don't want to write a sin about all this stuff. Let's just say that this doesn't happen and move on. And we all kind of agreed that, that was fine. But yes, I did. I did Google that and it was uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable listening to you Googling that. So also cremation takes time. Like it doesn't just incinerate you. It, it takes time. And there's parts of you that don't necessarily like cremate quick. Like you can yeah, cremate different like ways. 
Right. So there's like different types of cremation as well, where you can just take the fleshy bits once they've turned to ash and then the bones are buried separately. But if you want the bones to be ashed as well, then that's an even longer process. It just takes a lot of resources to burn hot enough to, you know, make that happen. And so, yeah, there's like, there's a whole thing. And I just obviously I didn't know all of this before I got started on this thing, but I am very confident that Jake would not just be like glancing in a window while people in the military are behind him saying, Hey, it's a good thing that your brother and you share DNA. (laughs) Like this is not something that would be normally, uh, normally happening. Another one that you might find interesting behind the scenes is the curling uh, iron. Mm -hmm. There's a sin about like reaching out and touching someone. And this is based on a true story of someone that I know whose little one reached up and touched a curling iron and got burned really, really badly. Turns out Jeremy had a story as well. So he had a note on this one. Um, He said, true story. When I was four, my brother told me to touch the clothes iron on the ironing board. He said it was not on. And he touched it himself to prove it. So then I touched it and burned the shit out of my finger. He burned his own finger just to get me to burn my finger. What an older brother move. Oh, my God. (laughs) Oh, that's awful. I know. I feel bad for laughing. I know. So I responded, holy shit, that's fucked up. Should we change this curling iron story to that one? You know, because that happened to you. And he yeah. said that he's almost positive that he's written a sin about it back in the day for anyone who's wanting to do like super major homework. I don't know if it's ever been written or not, but he he thinks it might have already been written. Uh, Danae, are you ready to move on? Yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, move on to our behind the center real quick. So tell me about yourself. We're all sinners. Every one of us. And what happens to sinners? Get to know each other better, you know? See, Daddy? Sinners have soul, too. The information! It's too much! Walk away, Mark. Just walk away. Nick wants to know, is there a previously released Sins video that you wish you could have worked on? So I, I kind of think about ones that I know really well that I've seen. Because there's something that happens whenever you're assigned a, a movie that you haven't seen before. You end up watching it and then forgetting kind of that you're writing sins about it because you're absorbing what you're watching. So your first watch is kind of not necessarily a loss, but it's a totally different experience than your second watch because you have a little bit of foreknowledge and there's a puzzle puzzle part of my brain that shuts off when I know it's going to happen because I'm not paying attention to plot lines or curiosity things. I'm just looking or thinking about how does this relate to what the movie was doing earlier? It's just easier for me to think about it from a sin perspective. And Never Ending Story would be one that from the very first time I watched it, I wouldn't have to think about what was already happening um, because I've seen that one many times. But I was just recently talking and uh, one that a couple of people on the team talked about was The Green Knight, that they would have been interested to see what I would have written on The Green Knight, which I mm. haven't seen that movie. And it's a weird one. So Mm -hmm. I remember watching the sins video being like, what the absolute fuck is going on? So I kind of agree. Like that'd be kind of one that has that sort of maybe King Arthur sort of medieval storyteller vibe. So maybe one of those two. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Similar question, but what is the sins video that you're glad that you didn't have to tackle or a film that if it gets scheduled, um, you hope you will not be assigned to? You know, we kind of touched on this earlier with like Game of Thrones and stuff. I am so thankful that my team will avoid giving me certain content because they know that I get triggered by it. Like I didn't have to uh, write on Squid Game and I didn't have to write on Handmaid's Tale. Once I watched it, I was like, this is not good for me to watch. I'm not enjoying this on a level that's like feels icky. I feel toxic. (laughs) And so... (laughs) I was really glad that we, you know, if we were to continue with Handmaid's Tale, I'm confident I wouldn't have to be writing on on that one because that one really gets me um, in a not a great way. Um, And Squid Game was another one that was just like, ah, this one's not not helping me. Or Game of Thrones, just making sure that if I am going to write on one that has a bad scene, my team tells me about it before I get there. And that's always appreciated. Um, But then there's like really big ones that might come out you know, in the future, like that are really complicated movies that do a lot of like in on themselves thinking like inception, like or Mm. multi-universe sort of dimensional stuff. That's like super cerebral tenet, I think was another one. Like I'm just things like that. I am glad that there are 
really cerebral people on the team that want to dig their teeth in because I would be afraid and they're like, give it to me. So I'm happy to take mm. a backseat on those. <laughs> uh, and then real quick, uh, let's do a quick game of three sins and a lie. Danae, would okay. you like to do um, Battle Los Angeles or The Mummy? Mm, the Mummy. Okay. The way this game works is I have four sins here. One of them is written by Joseph, not by a member of the team. So you have to guess which one Joseph wrote. Let's do it. Sin number one. This man uses son of the sons of the pharaohs and the plagues as expletives just to make them just to make sh- triple sure you know we're in Egypt. I will try not to butcher the rest of them as much as I did. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> Sin number two. Also, why wouldn't he assume it was some other blue stone since blue gold doesn't exist? It is because he's an idiot. And the movie also assumes that we're idiots and cannot relate to any other stone that holds value. Sin number three. When did Rick draw this pistol? Just a second ago, he was standing there with one foot behind the other and only one gun out. But in the span of the second, he's suddenly standing square and is firing two pistols. I don't care how good of a gunslinger you are. That's a move and I re- that, I, that I refuse to believe anyone, let alone Rick, can pull off. And sin number four. Also, it occurs to me that these people should be rounding up all the cats they can find and putting them in strategic places. Which reminds me, they could have set up a whole cat colony around the mummy's tomb and let a bunch of strays guard this lost city into eternity. The Medjai could have proved that uh, pr- provided them with food and kitty litter, and the world would be safe. Ooh, I think maybe one number one. Uh, the man uses sons of the pharaohs as the plagues, uh, and the plagues as expletives just to make triple four. sure. Or and you four. know I'm in Egypt. Uh, that's the cat one. I don't know. I never know these. Let's say four. Let's say the cat one. We'll be done. Uh, the correct one was the Rick drawing the pistol. Um, oh, that was the lie. very so. nice. Very nice. Win column JCD again. All right. <laughs> well, we'll move on to Beyond the Sins. We're a little bit on a time crunch uh, this week. So sorry about that. But don't worry. Um, you can bug Danae in Discord. She'll respond to you about all of the <laughs> Beyond the Sinner stuff. So that just leaves us with Beyond the Sins then. To infinity and beyond. Somewhere beyond my wild history. To boldly go where no man has gone before. Today, what is something you want to quickly recommend, warn, or recommend? Well, I had an international flight with free movies and decided to watch two movies oh, and a yes. TV show on my flight. And so I thought I would talk about one of the things that I watched, which is a foreign film called Official Competition with Penelope Cruz, Oscar Martinez, and Antonio Banderas. And it is fantastically quirky. It says it's a comedy drama. I agree with that. It's a very dry comedy. It's a very deep thinking drama at the same time. And the idea, actually, I think I kind of want to describe it in my own words because you can always read IMDb yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, This movie is quirky, but I haven't been able to stop thinking about it. And it's really interesting because the way it ends it actually kind of like puts something in your lap. So it inadvertently has made me think about it, not because of how it ends, but because of all that came before it. So it's very clever in the scenes. I love the cinematography of it. And um, I, I mean, personally, there's parts of it that I, I don't think I, I didn't like laugh out loud. So it's not like a comedy like that. It's just this, this dry kind of experience. Um, in short, This movie is kicked off because a very wealthy person decides that they want to leave a legacy and they want to make a movie, but they have no experience making a movie. So they purchase the rights to a book and they hire a very well-known director. And that director is played by Penelope Cruz, who is this very quirky woman. And she reads this book. And she puts together this film idea and she brings together two actors to play in her film. One of them is Antonio Venderes and the other is Oscar uh, Martinez. And so the Oscar Martinez character is like this, maybe more like method actor who doesn't have a ton of awards, uh, but teaches acting class. And he definitely feels like he's his acting method is like the best. And he's really, really well known. And then Antonio Banderas' character is like the quote of maybe like Hollywood uh, famous kind of actor who has a lot of awards and is in a lot of things. 
um, to become famous and is really, really well known. And so she puts the two of them together. And this movie is kind of just like scene after scene of her drawing the character out of these actors and kind of the setup of what this film is going to be about. Uh, this movie is okay with sitting in silence. It's okay with uh, just like long takes. It's okay with close shots. It's okay with playing with the ideas of uh, uh, what makes something great and what doesn't. And yeah, it still gives me a lot of things to think about. Um, and I highly recommend it. It is a foreign film. So you're going to be reading um, subtitles unless you can speak Spanish. <laughs> um <laughs> But Penelope is really fascinating in this one. They all are. Every single one of them is just really brilliant to watch. So I can't recommend that one high enough. I don't usually. So I like foreign films. Like I remember when Amelie came out and I really enjoyed that one because it's also very quirky. Uh, so maybe I'm like a quirky foreign film girl. I don't know. I can't really probably judge myself off of two. But this one was one that I was watching. Funny story. Just real quickly. I was watching this, like I said, on the plane. Um, and behind me are children. This is a R-rated film with some nudity in it. And mm. <laughs> there's a couple of times I'm like expertly leaning to the left to fill in the gap between the chairs. And there was this one moment where I kind of like looked down and I looked back up and the scene had changed. And there's this half nude woman sitting on a bed, like breasts out. Mm -hmm. And I just like quickly turn and glance behind me. And the kid that's behind me, eyes are really wide. And I'm like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I have normally they don't let that kind of like normally it's like an edited version on an airplane for uh, that none reason. of them were edited in fact all of them I watched they had like a thing like this movie is unedited so please beware and I'm just like oh my god like it's not my responsibility but yeah. at the same time I was just like oh, okay all right all right so I didn't know how serious it was gonna get but the nudity on it is just really basic it was just like a topless woman there is like some sexual innuendo that's in it but yeah, yeah. nothing like that's super over the top so I, I wouldn't say that it's like it didn't get like super sexual or pornographic <laughs> it was so the bottom line is if you're on a plane and you have kids <laughs> with you and you see Danae yes just know that Danae is watching nudie films so yeah yeah that's exactly it oops <laughs> on a public plane did I did I guess the other movie right on um on the Twitter what was your guess uh, you said uh, you said you watched another one. Uh, I guessed No Time to Die. No. Do you mean to tell mm, you what it is? Kind of. The Incredible Burden of Massive Talent. The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. The unbearable. Yeah. Unbearable. Yeah. yeah. Unbearable yeah. Weight of Massive Talent. With uh, I Nick Cage. love that movie. Yep. Did you? Yep. Yeah, that one was a mindless watch that is absolutely just ripe for the sinning. Mm -hmm. So many things that are weird in that mm -hmm. one. But still fun to watch. My favorite person in that is Pedro Pascal. He was yeah, great. He's he's he was incredible. I love him. Uh, I'm gonna have a quick one. I saw Violent Night in the theaters, and uh, this is advertised as Die Hard if Santa Claus was John McClane, um, and kind of like stupid fun. And I just didn't really have fun with it. So I am almost wreck warning it because I think there is like the action is shot really well, and I think maybe like I would just was in a bad mood. I don't know. Like mm. have a beer and watch this movie and you should have a good time. I'm I'm not saying don't watch it. I'm saying I wanted it takes itself a little too seriously. And that's You're saying watch it underneath the influence of something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like like I said, I think the movie just takes itself a little too seriously with what it wants to do. So it just didn't hit me the right way. But I I seem to be the minority. Lots of people that I know are really liking this one. So uh um, that's okay. Not that loving it, but they're having a, a good time. time. Yeah. Yeah. Like a Fast and Furious movie, you know. Well, that'll do it for this week. Thanks, Danae. I appreciate yeah. talking with you. Yeah, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Anything you want to send people to hang out with you more? Uh, Yeah, I hope to be on Twitch more now that I'm back from traveling. So you can go to Danae Says, that's D-E-N-E-E-S-A-Y-S -E -E um, on Twitch and also on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I continue to play a, a very foul-mouthed character called Babs in the Wild West it's set to the Red Dead Redemption 2 uh, backdrop on a private server where it's all based on role play. So we're all improvising our stories while navigating around in these little video game characters. And my video game character is a very foul mouthed little chick. Um, and her name is Babs. And I, I try to role play her on Fridays in the evening. Um, and then on Mondays, I do a podcast with Aaron. 
And I'm hoping to do even more over on the CinemaSins Twitch as well, which is CinemaSins Live on Twitch. Woo! And Captain's Pod. And Captain's Pod, of course. Yeah, you guys can find me over there enduring Captain Ian. (laughs) (laughs) Oof. And you can follow me on Twitter, Letterbox, Dutch White Castle. And uh, if you have feedback on the show, uh, send it to the Twitter, CinemaSinsBTS or BTSCinemaSins.com. We'll get either one of those. Um, We'd like to hear whatever feedback you have. So uh, lastly, don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you're listening from. And come on back next Thursday for more Behind the Sins content. Thanks for listening. Send any feedback to BTS at CinemaSins.com. And be sure to subscribe, rate, and comment. Find more ways to connect by visiting CinemaSins.com slash BTS. I also stopped by for my chocolate, which my Mm. mom got me for my birthday. She swung through Ikea, I guess, recently. Brave woman that she is. (laughs) And picked up a belonging. Belonging? I don't know. Uh, It's the rewarding taste of truly good chocolate. Is it good? Yeah, it's pretty good. It's like 60% cacao. And the number one ingredient is chocolate liqueur. (laughs) Mm. Okay. Then we've got sugar, then Uh cocoa, then cocoa butter, then roasted coffee beans. We've got some sunflower leaching. I don't know what that is. Milk, natural flavor, and then certified organic is apparently an ingredient. I don't I don't understand (laughs) that. (laughs) You don't just add certified organic when you're cooking? I don't know how I feel about that. I have weak wrists, apparently. He also said, as far as the narrator notes for future narrator voice. Oh, is that for different? That's a different one. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll stop. We'll get there. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Move on to Tuesday's video then. Would you shut up? Move on to (laughs) Tuesday.